thank you again, Kaylee and Marcia, Joe and Joe, for leading us this morning. And we are praying that uh, the Lord would be our vision today as we approach His Word, as He informs our hearts and leads us in life. Well, good morning. The grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. Thank you so much. We, uh, we have a men's group that meets uh, every two weeks, the first and third Fridays of each month in, uh, at Dr. Tatum's uh, office in his basement. He's got a nice little you know, rumpus room down there, and we have, we have a good time down there. But we, uh, we have serious discussion. We have a good discussion Friday, we're about 14, 15 of us, uh, about how to handle God's Word, about how, how do we read the Bible and do it faithfully. And uh, the big takeaway was that in any given, con- any given text that we find, there is one and only one intended meaning, although there may be many different applications of that one meaning. And so our goal as faithful stewards of the Word is to find that that intended meaning that God has for us. And most often, it's the, it's the simplest meaning. Most often, it's, it's the most plain meaning that's, that's, the tru- that's the truth. But there are times when the, the plain meaning requires some, some work on our part. And, and sometimes we've got to study context and historical background and cultural circumstances and, and the audience and sometimes even, even grammar. I'm sorry to say, sometimes even grammar. And our text this morning is, is kind of one of those, sort of. You're going to have to work a little bit at it. And, uh, but there's a very, very meaning to it. And, and once that plain meaning comes, it is powerful. It is good. It is rich. It is deep. And it changes lives. And, and so I think the work is well worth it. As often happens, I begin my study and think that I'm going to present to you a, a sermon on cer- a certain number of verses. And so I chose John 15, 1 through 8, but I'm, I think I'm only going to get through about the first three verses today. Okay, because, because I, think, I think the text is so deep that it, it needs at least that much time to breathe. And so this is at least a two-parter, if you will, in regard to this, this part of John's gospel. So this is the next in our ongoing series of of looking at John's gospel together. We're now in chapter 15, the very personal and private moments that Jesus has with his disciples, now down to 11, as he makes his way to Passion Week and the cross. So so turn with me uh, to John 15, beginning in verse 1, and I'll go through all eight verses because that's, that's the chunk of the idea. And just as there are, there's, there's one truth and many potential applications, Jesus tells us today that there is indeed one vine and many branches. So hear with me God's word. And what I read to you, what you hear, what you read, make no mistake, this is nothing less than the inspired word of God and uh, almost all of it, uh, red letters if you will, this, this is the, these are the words of Jesus, he's speaking to his disciples, and to us right here, right now, in this place. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray as we allow God's word to unveil itself to us. Father, we do thank you for your word that is rich and deep and uh, 
Lord, we, we do want to plumb the depths of your word. We, we want to understand the true and plain meaning of what you have for us. And Lord, would you make us ready for that? And, and Lord, would you allow us to delight in what you have for us? That uh, we would take it in, we would drink it in, uh, consume it, and, and allow it to become a part of ourselves. That, that we would be different today when we leave here than when we came in. And, and that by the power of your word and by your spirit. Father, forgive me for the mistakes I will make this day, and I pray you remove them from our minds and memories. But everything, Lord, that's good, that's in accord with your word, let all those things root down in our hearts and minds that we can indeed bear fruit for your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we've been, fl- we've been going along in John's gospel deliberately since January of 2014. So we're, we're now in month, what, 15 or 16 or so, and we're going to continue on. So, so if you haven't been with us, uh, well, you can go back and listen to some of the sermons. They're online, and, and you, you might want to get caught up. But in chapter 14 that we just left of John's gospel, he has been, Jesus has, he's been describing to his disciples what he would, what he would do for them when he departs their company. He's, he's getting ready to go to the cross. He's saying, I'm, I'm leaving. And he tells them, he prepares them about what he is going to do for them as he leaves. He, he would go and prepare a place for them, right? He's going to do that. He, he's going to supply their every need through the Holy Spirit. He, he's going to maintain, manifest himself. He's going to show himself to them. He's going to maintain them in a relationship with himself. And, and if you look at chapter 14, there's an abundant use of the personal pronoun, me, as Jesus talks about what he is going to do for his disciples in his absence. But if you look at chapter 14 and compare it to now chapter 15, you'll notice if you study that Jesus begins using the personal pronoun you a whole lot more frequently. He changes from me to you. And he teaches what, see here, his disciples are to do and what they are to be during his absence. So he's starting to to shift a little bit away from what he's going to do to what they're going to be responsible for. John 15 is all about how we are to live as his followers while he is no longer among us, at least with his physical presence. And he teaches this lesson. Jesus does, by using a a metaphor of something that that was very familiar to his disciples and the people of that time and and age, but but we're not very familiar with this metaphor, though, ourselves. At least most of us. I I know I'm not. I I don't think most of us are. It's a metaphor of a vineyard, a vineyard. And uh, so we're going to have to learn something about, about what it means to take care of a vineyard, about vines, so that we can glean the, the best and, and, and most clear and in the plainest sense of what he's teaching. We, we have to learn something about, about vineyarding, okay? So, so uh, I've never kept a vineyard, city boy that I am. I, I, you know, I, I can barely keep grass cut, but I, I, I don't know anything about vineyards or flowers. Or, I'm just not, it's not me. I, I grew up in, on asphalt. My backyard was about this big, okay? Not much bigger. It was about that big. We played on the street. I don't know anything about this sort of thing. Uh, but this passage has required me to learn something about, about what it means to be a, a vine keeper, a gardener, a, a vineyard keeper. And, and I think what I've learned has really helped unlock uh, the power of, of the teaching here. And I want to share some of those things with you about the metaphor of the vineyard. The, the parts of it are easy enough to understand. They're, they're easy. Jesus is the vine. Okay, he says that. God the Father is the gardener or the vine dresser, or the farmer, if you will. He's the one who takes care of, of the vineyard. And the followers of Jesus, his disciples, and including any of us who are, are, who are his disciples, are, are the branches who, who may bear no fruit, or some fruit, or maybe even a whole lot of fruit, or somewhere in between, more than likely. Now, you might think of the vine as the long, spindly limbs that sprawl along the ground or along a fence or a wall. But those are actually the branches. Those are not the vines. We we call them that, but those are not, those are branches. The vine is the the trunk of the plant. The the vine sticks up out of the ground about three or four feet, 
and, it, and it's kind of heavy. It, it's, it's, a, it's a thicker piece of wood. It, it ends in kind of a, in kind of a gnarly thing. A gnarly kind of look, looks like a, a big fist. And, uh, and the, the branches come out of, of the, so the vine is, is only this high. And the branches come out of that. And, and they live and, and they have sustenance based on their connection to, to the vine. Those are the, those are the branches, you see. And, uh, and what grows off the branches are the, uh, are the, are the grapes, are the grapes. Um, so at least from the healthy, the healthy branches, they, they give big grapes. And from some branches that are not healthy, you may not get any grapes. Uh, the gardener, the vine dresser, the vineyard keeper is the one who looks after all this stuff. All over, and, and his goal is, her goal is to, is to achieve the, uh, the biggest and juiciest grapes that he or she can. That's the goal. I want, I want lots of and, and large, juicy grapes. So, so that kind of sets the, the, the picture, if you will, of the metaphor that he's using. And so maybe you know a little bit more about, about the vineyard than you did before. Um, I, I hope that was helpful. Um, this is your agricultural lesson for today, okay? That, and that's really the extent of my agricultural knowledge. That's it. And so what, what I know, you now know. So have fun with all that. But, but um, we're going to move from an agricultural lesson now into a, uh, a lesson of, of biblical theology a little bit here because we have to start to merge some ideas together. And so the first thing Jesus says about himself in verse 1 is that not only is he the vine, but he says, I am the what vine? The true, he says, I'm the true vine. That, he uses that qualifier. And, and that's important, okay? You see, throughout the Old Testament, and it's, it's replete with this, the vine is a common symbol for Israel over and over again. The vine represents the covenant people of God. And, and you'll see it in the Psalms. You'll see it in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, uh, Jeremiah. It's all over the place. You see it in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, the parables of the wicked tenants, uh, uh, of the laborers in the vineyard, the barren fig tree. That's all, that's all vineyard imagery, and all of it is about the people, it's about the nation. And what's most remarkable is you read all these things about Israel as that symbol, it's always referred to about the vine's failure to produce good fruit. It is always, the story is always it has failed to produce good fruit. And then it brings, it brings along God, God's judgment with it. So it's, it's, it's a serious tone that it takes. Now, in contrast to that failure, Jesus made the claim, I am the true vine. That's what he said. In, is, that's the context. I am now the true vine, which means he is the one to whom Israel is pointed toward. He has now come to fulfill that which was happening and promised, but never happened, but it happened through him. And we've seen other similar statements like this in John's gospel, very consistent. And remember chapter 1, verse 9, Jesus is the true light, because John the Baptist was a light, but he was merely a lamp lighting the way until the true light came. So he, he fulfilled, he, he came in and did what was only partially done. In chapter 2, Jesus was the, the true temple. Remember, he was standing in the temple. I'll destroy this in three days. Jesus said, you've worshipped on this hill in a place called Jerusalem, but now you're going to worship me in, in my body. I'm, I'm the true temple. I'm the fulfillment of. Chapter 6, Jesus said, I'm the true bread from heaven. As opposed to, to the manna that was given in the wilderness that fed the people but was only temporary. And now you can feed upon me for, for life, eternal life. You see, in all these things... Jesus displaces, he supersedes, he fulfills all that came before him, all the promises of God from the very beginning. He is the fulfillment of all. And that is, of course, why we say, are you ready? The Bible is one comprehensive story about Jesus Christ from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. That's why we say that with confidence because it's his story. Everything leads in the direction of everything. But here's Jesus saying that he's the true vine, which means that he even supersedes now Israel as the focal point of the people of God. That's exactly what he's saying. 
Perhaps the, the clearest passage that, that speaks to this, we find in the Old Testament, it's in, in the Psalms. I'm going to ask you to turn to Psalm 80 in your Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible, there are a few Bibles in the front, or you can dial it up on your smartphones. Psalm 80 is the clearest picture of, of how the vineyard imagery comes together with the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. I think it, it puts this all together very nicely, very succinctly. Very clearly. And we're going to look at Psalm 80, beginning in verse 7. Beginning in verse 7. This is a, a time when the people are in captivity. Israel is no more, and they are now slaves. They are now been, they've been taken away. All has been lost. The country is in ruins, and they are gone away to captivity by foreign invaders. And the psalmist writes this, Restore us, God Almighty, Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. You transplanted a vine from Egypt and you drove out the nations and planted it. That's, that's from the Exodus. Remember, he, they, they were in Egypt captive. He, he brought them out from their bondage 400 years. He, he brought them out and he cleared a path. He cleared a way and he planted a vine in the land that he promised. So, so you, God, we know you've, you've already done this for us. You've blessed us. They're asking for him to do it again. Do it again. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root, and it filled, it filled the land. You did everything you promised. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea. It shoots as far as the river. It was good. It was splendid. Israel was all that you had said it would be. But then circumstances changed, and the people fell away and they forgot their God. And so, verse 12, Why have you now broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? They, they've been plundered and taken away because of their disobedience. They say, Boars from the forest ravage it, and insects from the fields feed on it. They had been decimated, and all that God had given them had been taken away. And so they cry out in verse 14, Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven. Watch over this vine. Watch over this vine. The root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Now, now, let your right hand rest on the, let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Who's he talking about? Talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. Raise him. This is the Psalms written hundreds of years before that, 800 years before that. Then we will turn, turn, not turn away from you. Revive us. We will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. And so it is. Jesus has become the true Israel. He is the true vine. His followers, wherever they are, including Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, are the branches because they have life that emanates from that vine. And they are no longer restricted to geographical boundaries. We're not worried about the country of Israel anymore. We're not worried about geopolitical actions. The, the kingdom is now, it is here, and it grows from the living God who's the living vine. And we, the church, are His branches. It is here, and it is now, and it is yet to come in perfection, but it's now. Make no mistake, it's not some mystical, futuristic event that needs to be predicted by adding certain numbers together or by looking at how many blood-red moons there are going to be. That's just a bunch of bunk. Forget about it. The kingdom is now, and he calls us to it. The end will come. It'll come in God's appointed time, of which no one knows. And Jesus said himself, don't even worry about it. Don't concern yourself, but be my disciples here now. Be branches of the living vine, is what he says. That's the message of Christ. It always was, and it still is. I am the true vine. I'm the true Israel, and my followers are the branches. This is my, this is my church, is what he's saying. This is, this is my body. This is my body. And so that's your... That's your lesson in biblical theology for today. To pair up with your agricultural lesson, 
We're putting, we see, we're, we're trying to get the plain truth. We're having to do a little bit of work to understand the full context of this. Now in verse 2, he says, Jesus does, according to the NIV, and, and we use the NIV here, many of you have to find translation, but in this case, it's a really poor translation. And I'm going to tell you why I think that. And, and, I, and I don't usually dwell on things like this, but in this case, I think it's really important. He says that the gardener cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. See, that, that translation, I think, is unfortunately, in my opinion, a very bad translation. It needs to be corrected in order to have a true understand the plain meaning of what he's saying here. See, there are times we can bypass little idiosyncrasies in the translation from Greek or Hebrew to English, but this is not one of those cases. We've, we've got to dig deeper here to un- uncover what Jesus is saying. Now, now, some of you are turned on by this. Some of you don't like it. But the, the word that Jesus uses here in the Greek is, is aero. It, it, so so when, he, when, when the English NIV says cuts off, they're taking the, the Greek word aero to mean cuts off. But the, the primary meaning, the, the, the overwhelming meaning of the word arrow is to lift up. That's what, lift up your voices. Anywhere you see it in the Bible, it's, it's almost always lift up. And so I, I believe that what Jesus means in this verse is the gardener will lift up every branch in me that bears no fruit. Now, now he, here's why this is so important. This is not, this is not a minor detail. Uh, now, first of all, Jesus here is speaking to his disciples. He's not speaking to a broad audience. He's speaking to, the, to his, his 11, his followers, which includes you if you're a follower of him. To those who are already in him. Because he, he, that's, that's the verb. It's, it's those who are in me. And if you're in Jesus, you can't be cut off and thrown away. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. If you're given new life, it's life that you have. Dead branches can't grow out of a living vine. They do not. See, what what Jesus and his disciples understood clearly that we might not is that the branches that grow out of a vine are wild and they're long and they're mischievous in their own ways. And they tend to, in real life, I'm back to agriculture now, they tend to trail down along the ground. And, and, and what happens is they, they get covered in dirt. And then when it rains, they get, they get muddy and they get mildewy. And, and when that happens, the, the branches get sick. They get sick and they, and they can't produce fruit. They can't produce grapes. And what the vineyard keeper does is this, and I studied this, they don't cut those, those branches off. They're too valuable. They will pick them up with their hands, and they will lift them up, and they will tie them to a post or to a tree or to a fence or to a trellis. You know what a trellis? That's when you see a, vine, a vineyard, a vineyard, you see, you see branches that are, that are hanging on things. That's so that they can get up out of the dirt and be given sunlight and, and, and water. And, and be healthy and vibrant. The, the gardener doesn't, doesn't leave them. He lifts up those branches. And he gives them air. He gives them sunlight so they can get healthy. That's a picture of salvation. When you're in Christ, even that first moment, you, re, you realize you're dead in your sins, that you've got nothing to bring to the game. You're, you're in the dirt. And what does he do? He doesn't stamp on He doesn't cut you off. He lifts you up. And he puts you on a trellis. And he gives you the opportunity to experience life. To have light shine into your life. To to be watered and sprinkled by other people who are believers. That's what our God does. He lifts up. He doesn't cut off when you're in Christ. He lifts up. And so if if your Bible translation says the gardener cuts off, I'll invite you, if you want, to scratch that out of your Bibles. Because I do not think that is a, a good representation, an accurate translation of what is meant here by Jesus whatsoever. And so uh, I'll scratch that out for you if you don't have the guts to do it. It's not, it's not wrong that you're not defying God's word because God's word is what it means. It's not always the translation of what some group of men thought it was. The translations can be, can be in error sometimes. God's word never is. And so we're working to get to the plain meaning of what Jesus said. And I think very clearly, contextually, biblically, culturally, agriculturally, he's talking about 
vines, branches that are being lifted up to be given new life. I think it's very clear. I think that's the plain meaning by far. That's been my experience because I was one of those branches in the dirt. He lifted me up. He lifted me up. Oh, yes. Now, those are the branches that Christ, that are in Christ that are not bearing fruit. But God doesn't even ignore the branches that already are bearing fruit. He tends to them as well. He doesn't, he doesn't leave you to your own device. He still comes back. And most translations, NIV, say that the, these branches in Christ that don't bear fruit, He prunes. And, and that's okay as far as it goes. I, I, I can live with that. But there's a, a, a clearer meaning than that even. Uh, and and the, the, that verb, the clearest meaning is to clean. The, the, again, if, you, if you're a Greek studier, I know Jeanette is, the, the Greek word that's used is katharos. And it means literally to clean. It's cleaning. Even in, if you go to verse 3, he says you're already clean. He uses the same word there, except it's, it's adjectival form. You're already clean. He uses katharos there. So, so why would they use prune in one place but clean? He's talking about cleaning. And, and here's, why, here's why I know, I think this is true. Because when I studied my agriculture, uh, about the, the, the vineyard keeper picking up the, the, uh, the vines, th they also will take buckets of water with them. And they'll wash off the leaves because they have gotten dirty and muddy and mildewy. And so, and so the vineyard keeper, the gardener, he cleans. He cleans the branches so that they can, so that they can grow more fruit, keep them healthy. So, so I, think, I think cleaning fits this whole metaphor very, very well. Very, because that's what, a, that's what a vineyard keeper does. I think that's what Jesus is talking about. Now, even, I'll go one step further. Contextually, if you go back to chapter 13, remember the, the whole thing about Jesus washing the disciples' feet? Remember that with the water? And, and remember Peter said, he says, no, Lord, uh, not just my feet, but my head and my hands too. And, and what did Jesus say? He said, you're already clean. You're already clean, but, but not all of you. Because Judas was still with them then, but not, but, but not all of you. You're, you're clean. And what, and what did we say was being what was clean? He was cleaning with his word. It was, the, it was the washing of the word that makes them clean. And we said it's that dirt, that, that mildew that builds up on your feet, if you will, as you're walking through life day by day, week by week, that needs to be cleaned up. You're saved. That situation doesn't change because he keeps you. But then you need to be, you need to be washed by the word to get that stuff off of you and to be able to, to spring forth and and give light and bear fruit for the kingdom. That's what he's talking. He's talking about the same thing here because here we go to, to, to verse 3, and he says what again? You're already clean. Look in verse 3. You're already clean. Same thing he said in verse 13. He doesn't qualify at this time because Judas isn't there. It's just the 11. They are all his true disciples. You are already clean. And you are clean by what? By the word I gave you. Same thing. Contextually, it all fits together. That's the... See, that's the magnificence of the Word of God. It's not a bunch of separate stories that are cobbled together, you know, randomly. It is one entire comprehensive story about Jesus Christ from beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation. It's all there. But sometimes it takes a little bit of work to see how it all comes out, to get the plain and the full and the blessed meaning. It's all there. And I love it. So, he's talking about those who are in Christ, in Christ. And here's what we know. If we're in Christ, if we're living in the vine, we are lifted up out of the dirt, taken to a new place where we can thrive and live. If we're in Christ, living in the vine, even if we're showing signs of fruitfulness and life, he still comes and cleans us and makes us to thrive even more more. Those in Christ, those living in the vine are not cut off. They're not thrown away. They're not forgotten about and left to their own devices. In Christ, we're lifted up and we're cleaned because being in the vine means having life. It means having life, not for some day in the future, but now, today, in him, rooted in the vine. And we have a great God 
and call him what you will, the one and only, the I am, the one who was and is and always will be, the Alpha, the Omega, the great gardener. And he sees to it that he lifts us up to give us life. And even then, he washes us and he cleans us by the power of his word under the influence of his Holy Spirit. And he gives us beautiful, gorgeous, grand life. That's only three verses. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the power of your word and for the ways that it, it, it moves us to, to look deeper, to find, to find your truth in ways that, that just astounds us. Lord, uh, I, I thank you for putting that on our hearts today, to, to want to really and truly embrace the true meaning of your word, that we would be changed, not for a time in the future, but changed for today. Father, for all those who have gathered here today, I pray that you would give each of them an earnest desire to drink your word, to feast on your word, to be open to the moving of your Holy Spirit, that in his power you would reveal truth, that you would convict lives, that you would bring healing, that you would make us citizens of the kingdom in the places you've called us to be. Father, would you bless our church? Would you bless this congregation and our communities? Would you bless those who are in need of healing and comfort? Lord,